a lecture by a truly remarkable scientist, uh, but also to a renewal of an important tradition in the Yale Physics Department. And specifically, this is the renewal of our uh, Miller Bright Prize Lecture Series. Um, this is an annual prize lecture that's intended to be as broad as possible and to bring uh, every year an exciting and inspiring speaker to the physics department. Um, it was named for two members of the Yale Physics Department, uh, two prominent members of the Yale Physics Department, John Milton Miller, who you see here, who is a graduate of Yale and, uh, and the physics department and worked as a physicist with the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, where his work was on what we might think of as electrical engineering, but he was definitely a theoretical and experimental physicist. He developed the Miller theorems regarding certain classes of equivalent circuits. He worked on the theory of vacuum tubes, crystal oscillators, very important things. He won uh, prizes from the Naval Research Laboratory in 1945, the Distinguished Civilian Service Award, and the highest honor from the IEEE uh, which at that time was also the International uh, Association of Radio Engineers. And he spent much of his career as a physicist with the National Bureau of Standards, though also with other places. And you can see up here a, a characteristic um, publication of his. And I show you all of this because this is a lecture is named for two individuals, John Milton Miller and Greg Bright, who's shown at the bottom, whose CVs in many ways seem to be very different. Um, but who share some surprising things in common that are sort of uh, illustrate some of the wonderful aspects of physics as a field. Greg Bright, who this series is also named for, uh, was Yale faculty for about 20 years from the 40s into the 1960s. He's probably best known as a theoretical nuclear physicist whose name is associated with the Bright frame uh, for calculating scattering processes, for the Bright Wigner distribution, for the Bright Wheeler process. He was a pioneer in theoretical nuclear physics, including the use of computers, which was well ahead of its time. But his beginning was very much uh, in work that would have been quite close to John Milton Miller. As far as I know, these two, I don't know anything about their collaborations or connections, uh, but they both worked at the National Bureau of Standards at the time when Greg Bright was working on things like uh, the physics and engineering of electrical systems. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's kind of a wonderful coincidence that we have ended up with this um, series named for uh, two individuals whose careers illustrate the amazing span that physics can have even within the purview of a single person's work. Um, this lecture series uh, was endowed at first by the Miller family in the 1960s and then was merged with the Bright Fund in the 1980s. It's been more or less dormant since about the year 2000, but uh, the department as a whole uh, is very enthusiastic about renewing this series. And I couldn't think of a more uh, exciting and inspiring way to restart this series than by doing so with today's speaker, Professor Roger Penrose. Um, so I had a few things that I wanted to say by way of introduction, though, uh, this is truly an intimidating task. Uh, Roger Penrose is the Emeritus Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University. His contributions to physics, um, science, mathematics, and uh, the intellectual pursuits uh, is hard to overstate. This has been recognized by a number of prizes. I'll give you a very short list. These include the Heinemann Prize, the Ed Eddington Prize, the Wolf Prize, the Royal Medal of the Royal Society, the Dirac Prize, the Albert Einstein Medal. Uh, he was knighted in 1994 and became Sir Roger the De Morgan Prize in 2004, and most recently the Nobel Prize of 2020. Roger Penrose's uh, work has had a tremendous impact on theoretical physics, where he's best known perhaps for his work on general relativity and the introduction of Penrose diagrams, the study of causal relationships in space time, the study of singularities, and uh, the concept of censorship hypotheses, for example. He's very well known for the development of twister theory for asking provocative questions about quantum effects as they relate to general relativity and exploring the question of whether gravitational decoherence and macroscopic quantum phenomena might be used to test various aspects of quantum gravity. But his work is certainly not limited to theoretical physics. Um, his work has had impact on computer science, uh, partially in this provocative suggestion that there might be quantum mechanics at work in the brain, 
but also for his suggestions that led to the development of a theory of computing over the real numbers. In mathematics, he's well, very well known for uh, the invention of the Penrose tiling and for another problem I learned about recently called the unilluminable room, which I find fascinating. This might seem like enough, uh, but uh, Roger's work has had impact well outside the usual venues of physics, including in art and design. Um, and I wanted to show a couple examples of this. Um, one is that his work inspired M.C. Escher to create some of his most famous images. The Penrose tiling invented by uh, Roger has been built all over the world. Um, and his own drawings are an inspiration to people who uh, are excited about the possibility of using visual arts to convey information about physics and science. So this is a text from a letter from Escher to Roger Penrose from 1960, in which he acknowledges that one of Roger's own drawings inspired him to create this image known as Ascending and Descending, one of his most famous works. Um, the Penrose tiling, which is a simple aperiodic covering of a plane with five-fold symmetry, is shown in its canonical form here in the upper right, but is an inspiration to architects and designers all over the world. You can find it on the pavement in Helsinki, Finland. You can find it on the front, uh, on the facade. This is not a planar surface, so as I understand, getting the essence of the Penrose tiling correct on a curved surface is quite a thorny problem that Roger collaborates with architects in order to make sure it's done correctly. This is a, a project built by Pelly Clark Pelly. And uh, lastly, as a, someone who has brought physics to the masses in what we might call outreach or popularization, these two books, uh, especially prominent in my mind, I can't tell you as a senior in high school, uh, as an 18 year old, uh, what a uh, impact the Emperor's New Mind had on me. I mean, it, this was something that seemed to demonstrate that physics was a way of engaging with and exploring some of the most exciting and intriguing ideas that were out there. Um, so for all of this, uh, I would like to extend my thanks and I would like to extend the warmest welcome to Roger Penrose. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. And um, if you wanna to try to restart sharing of your screen, Let me I'll see. look forward very much to your talk. No, I lost the thing at the top, which does it. Despite all these um, things you've said about me, I can't make this machine work. <laughs> do, you was... see, um, do you see the share screen button at that's the bottom? Exactly, that's exactly what I don't see. Oh, the bottom. Yeah, and you may have to move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen. I've done that, but it's, there's nothing apart from my picture there. I don't see anything. In one of the screens at the oh, bottom. We got it. We got it. Hold on, Doug. Okay. We, we see your screen now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yes, you see. Ah, it's in my little screen. It's your. Oh, we see your oh. web browser. It's in my little screen, is it? But then I know I can't see my little screen. But still, I'll try. Um. Where is it? The top or the bottom? Um. I think if you can uh, get this to show PowerPoint. So if you go down to that red P that I see on the bar at the bottom of your screen. Are you moving my arrow? If so, you could do it. <laughs> no, sorry. This is uh, someone else's screen. Oh, oh, that's somebody else's screen. What? OK. So whoever is sharing your screen. I can please. see an arrow moving around, but it's not me. Whoever ah. it is, can you do it? <laughs> yeah, it says we're viewing Pierre Demarc's screen. Pierre is the top right. Well, can you make it so it's my screen, or can you actually do what you want? Oh, yes, click it off. Um, Pierre, please stop sharing your screen. Yeah, whoever's the host, you should can be able do to that? stop uh, Pierre from sharing. Ah. Oh, is that your screen? Mm, well, it's not yeah. the one I'm seeing at the top. No, my, oh, my mouse, is it doing it? So, Eduardo. No. Eduardo uh, Walter, can you remove uh, Pierre's screen else. sharing, please? <laughs> it's somebody else doing it. It's not my screen. It's, it's got two. It's neater, neater and tidier than mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's, uh, that's not my, yeah. So Eduardo or Walter, did you just end that person's screen sharing? I, I just removed them. Thank you.
No. Is my is that? I, I, I'm not sure whether my mouse is doing anything down there. Is it? No. So I can't see your screen. Are you on the Zoom window where you can see a gallery of everyone? I can faces? see my first picture. I mean, maybe I can just give my lecture like this. <laughs> no, let's. Um, I can. Maybe I just do it and stop wasting time. Oh uh, well, I think we can help spend, you find it. If we spend there's one supposed to be two there. windows. There's supposed to be two windows. Yes, I've got my window, which I see you, and I see lots of people at the top, including myself. So on that window. Down at the bottom, there should be a green button that says share screen. You might yeah. need to move your cursor over all of be. our pictures. It would be nice if there were one, but I don't happen to see one. Well, I can see now somehow I can move my arrow onto the little screen. Yes. Can I keep moving it down from the top screen? See if it appears. It hasn't appeared on the little screen. Nope. It's not there. I mean, the top, it's on the top screen. My mouse is there and my slides is there. And if you can see my slide, can you? No, no we're not. <laughs> That's a slight snag in that case. So um, on the screen where you see all of our faces. Yes. Do you see a button down at the bottom that says share screen? No, but I can't even see my cursor, let alone the button. You may have to click in that screen in order to make it come to the forward. Yeah, just click on it. How click do I click on, on it? Because my arrow doesn't want to be in that screen. It's on the, it likes to be on the big screen. Maybe I can move it to the left. Can you close one of them so you're back to just one screen? I haven't discovered how to do that. My, my arrow is on the big screen. Now, is in there any way of moving it onto the little screen? I can see two little arrows at the bottom. Is that the use? That's the only thing I can see. I'm a little nervous about clicking on either of them. Yes, it just moves my slide. But since you can't see my slide, that's not much point, is it? On, on the screen where you can uh, uh, turn on and off your microphone to mute it or not, do you yeah. see that? You nope. can see the microphone and the camera? Nope. Okay, so- Can you exit your PowerPoint slides? That might help us. I can see my PowerPoint slide and I just, it's in the show that I would want to show, I would hope you all see. Yeah, why don't you turn it off? Why don't you press turn escape. it off? If what, you unplug press it? escape, that should take you out of the... Uh, I'm a bit nervous about that. I could unplug it and then it'll go off. You think uh, I should do that? No. I wouldn't unplug it. I would just... Can you press the escape button? Oh, you mean on my, on my keyboard? Yeah. Oh, escape. Now what? Um, You're there. Take you ah! Now I've got an arrow. Yes. Okay. Now I'm getting this. Now I just press this invisible little square at the bottom there somewhere. Where is it? Is that one. Is that it? Maybe it's the wrong one. So are you able now to move your cursor over the screen where you see all of our faces? <laughs> It's the bottom screen is showing something entirely different now. I think it's, modern technology is wonderful, but I, I can't cope with it. It's now oh, showing yeah. a different lecture on the bottom screen. Oh no, it's showing the Yale. I know it's showing my my uh, top, my title and abstract. That's what it's showing. Except that I can't get the arrow onto it. If I could get my arrow onto the other screen, I could move things around, but it's not going on the other screen. Another possibility is if it's easy for you to send me your slides, I could share. I don't think that sounds riskier than things I'm doing. Well, this moves them, yeah. Um, is it possible to quit PowerPoint and then reopen it? 
I think he's not finding the controls for Zoom. You should be looking at Zoom windows. Right? Yeah. I'm just trying to get it back to maybe just the one window. Well, there should be two. There's always two. Right? Did the Zoom window have been shifted down so the controls aren't showing? Yeah. Roger, you are muted, so we can't hear you. <laughs> I think he muted himself now. Okay. But unintentionally, I assume. If he found the mute button, then he's in the right uh, ball. That's cluster. right. <laughs> if, if you found the mute button, the share screen button is right next to that. And I think that's what happened. He just missed the. I wonder if he has any grandkids around. <laughs> I think the host should be able to unmute him. Uh, that's true. Eduardo or Walter, could you do that? Ah, I've unmuted myself. So wherever Bravo. you found the mute button, yes, the share sure. screen button should be just to the right. Same, same area, but not right next to it. On the same line. Uh, can you see anything? Nope. No, you're not sharing yet. But, but near the mute button, there's just a strip of controls. And there there's a green one that says share screen. If it was that mute button, I would know what you mean. But the mute button I saw was in the middle of the screen. Oh. Unmute button. So it's a different yeah, I, I think the unmute button he saw was when uh, we asked him to unmute, so something popped up in his screen. Now, how do I get myself onto? Heck, he might try to do Alt S if he had application in ah, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can see there's something underneath here. Ah, there's another one. Let's get rid of that. Ah, yes, 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 yes. It was hiding underneath. Hiding underneath. Okay. Now, am I unmuted? Yes. We can hear you. Okay. Now I can also see you. So that's help helpful. What am I supposed to be doing now? Doing so if you move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen. You should see a a button that says share screen. Oh. Green. Only green one there. Yeah. And, oh, it's hidden underneath, but I guess I can move that thing that's hidden underneath. Yes, not going to list it. Okay. Oh, I've sh am I, can you hear me still? Yes. yes. And I clicked on the thing which your picture on the share screen, but that's not, has anything worked? What's okay. next? No, it should then give you a Alt S. What's that? Uh, on your keyboard, could you press Alt S? Alt, where would that be? I think he's already shared screen now. He needs to choose which, uh, which. Yeah, you gotta choose, yeah. We're trying you to have a choice? I'm choosing it, oh, so but nothing's happened. Oh yes, nice oh, no, we got Here it. you are. <laughs> yep, we can see it. Can yeah, you see my PowerPoint then? Yes. Yep. Okay, oh, go. Good. Well, move it back to the middle. Is it is it central because it's not with me? No, no, it's not. Now it's central. Now it's good. Now just uh, slideshow. Now the slideshow thing is at the top. Yep, yep, that's one way to do it. Well, that's the sheen scaring. Oh, the sheen scaring. It's at the top. Yes, yeah, so at the very top, you'll see a menu that says slideshow. Oh, slideshow. Uh, there Stop. you go. Up yeah. a little bit. Yep. No slideshow, go. that's it. And then play from start. Play from start. Top line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should work. It's going to work. Well, my fingers are thoroughly crossed. Ta -da! Can you see? Oh, great. Yes, we have, yeah. your, we have your first oh, slide. Here. We're all set. So welcome, uh, Professor Penrose. This is a, a huge treat for all of us. We, you know, regard the clock as starting now. We're very excited to hear whatever you have to say. Take your time. Well, you have a lesson on, on, on incompetence and making these things work. <laughs> okay. okay, I'll have a go. Well, I want to talk about the interplay between quantum mechanics and general relativity. Uh, these are the two great revolutions of 20th century physics. Uh, 
and they are, let me see if I can move the slides. Where do I do it down here, do I? No, that doesn't do it. How about this? Nope. Now I have to learn how to move them. Ah, it's working. It's two separate subjects. So I have them here as separate subjects. Now I'm going to consider. Not, it's not moving now. What can I do to move it? Are you on the bottom? Ah. Yeah, is it? Yes. I'm going to talk about the interplay between. Can you see my arrow up there? No, you can't. Can you? Oh, here. Now it's in there. Yes, that's it. You can see my arrow now, can you? Yes. Okay. Yes. So there is the in intersection between the two. Well, that's not really one to talk about. Um, I can't move the blasted things. Now, why don't we move? I can move it down here. Ah, now that moved. Except it moved two steps instead of one. You should be able to use just the up arrow and down arrow on the keyboard to advance by one slide. I should be able to, but it doesn't do anything. It does nothing. Um, I can click it on the bottom. That might do the trick. On your screen right now in the lower I, left hand. I think this will do. Let's go from here. I think we're all right. Anyway, um, I want to say, first of all, there are ways of treating general relativity within the framework of quantum mechanics. You will see in the middle of this picture these things called Feynman diagrams. This is one of the standard procedures for working in quantum field theory. And you can take general relativity and treat it according to these procedures. It doesn't really get you very far. It's extremely complicated. There are various simplifying techniques, including twister theory is one of them. But uh, it doesn't really get you very far. And if you want to talk about black holes and things like that, there are all sorts of divergence problems. So let me move on to the next picture if I can do it. It doesn't work if I move it there. Let me try at the bottom. Um, where's my arrow on the bottom screen? Ah. Here we go. Also, you can you do quantum mechanics within the framework of general relativity. This is sort of quantum theory and curved backgrounds. And it's a good, you can do things with it. It's not a complete theory because you don't get a, you can do your quantum mechanics, but they back, it doesn't get a back, you don't get a back reaction on the curvature of space. So it's a sort of half a theory in a sense, but it's useful in various contexts. Most particularly, it's useful in general relativity when Stephen Hawking used quantum theory and curved backgrounds to do what was his basically his greatest achievement, I think, which was to show that black holes are in a sense not entirely black because they radiate. So you, they have not only an entropy, which where well, there's the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole, which is the entropy is proportional to the surface area of the horizon, but um, <clears throat> He, Stephen gave a, uh, an exact formula, whereas Bekenstein just had a sort of um, <clears throat> a theoretical idea of how, why it should be the area. Anyway, um, the Hawking evaporation is, is an instance where you do get back re reaction because the radiation carries away energy. And so the black hole, I should explain that this is a space time diagram. Time is going up the picture. The bottom of the picture, we have some collapsing material and we have these light cones. I'll come back to that later because this is not particularly what I want to talk about at the moment. Now, let me see if I can move things onwards because I'm not clever enough to do that. Oh, here we go. What about the whole thing? Quantum mechanics and general relativity. Well, there are all sorts of schemes for doing this. String theory, loops, foams, many ideas like this. They're, all of them are far long way from any kind of experimental test, whether you believe in them or not. And they, uh, I don't want to talk about them. I just wanted to show that there are attempts to try and bring the two theories together. I want to pursue a different angle on this though. Um, oh, if I click the screen, that does it. 
I want the angle I want to talk about is really the problems that each theory has. On the right hand side, you see general relativity and its main problems are the singularities. You see, when you have gravitational collapse in the black hole, the curvatures diverge to become infinite, and you have these horrible singularities. These are meant to be light cones and things pointing into the singularity. So this is a big problem in general relativity. I'll come back to that. On the left hand side, we have what I regard as the main problem of quantum mechanics is the measurement problem. This is a sort of cartoon at the top of a cat, which is half dead and half alive. That's the sort of uh, the paradox of, of measurement in quantum mechanics, which is illustrated by Schrodinger's cat. So it's his half dead and half alive, alive a cat, half dead and half alive a cat. I want to talk more about the right hand side. Let's see whether quantum gravity, what it has to say about the singularities. So let's move on. Um, that works, doesn't it? See, one, one of the problems that one would try to use space uh, quantum theory, quantum gravity theory, is to try and maybe get rid of the singularities in space time. You see, you have these infinite curvatures that you arrive at in gravitational collapse in the middles of black holes. The curvatures of space time just diverge. But you, and lots of people, and these, I, I certainly was interested in it for this reason trying to quantize general relativity to try and get something which might be finite rather than infinite. The trouble is about quantizing gravity, it doesn't really solve the main problem of the curvatures. The reason why they don't is indicated here. And let me move on to the next thing because I have a picture of, I hope I've got the ordering right, of the vial curvature. You see, here I have an observer looking back and there are these two kinds of curvature. Space-time has, the curvature has 20 components at each point, and 10 of them are to do with the Ricci curvature, and the Ricci curvature is what the, is directly influenced by matter, and the Weyl curvature is what's left. That describes the gravitational degrees of freedom. The Ricci curvature, if you see, I imagine an observer at the top of this picture looking back along the, the cone, this is the light rays coming to that observer, and they start to focus inwards due to the, the matter content, the matter that traverses the light cone. And that is the, uh, the Ricci curvature, which does that. We'll actually trace free, but don't worry about that. It's the Ricci curvature, which does that. What's left is the vial curvature that distorts. So your image of what you're looking at would get distorted. And this is due to the vial curvature. The vial curvature describes the free gravitational field, the gravitational degrees of freedom are in the vial curvature and the matter degrees of freedom are in the Ricci curvature. So it's really nicely separated in that way. Now, and what I was saying is that the vial curvature in the singularities in black holes go to infinity, whereas the vial curvature goes to zero or something like it, very, very small in the Big Bang. So if you have a theory of quantum gravity, it has to give you completely different answers for what you have in the future, these singularities in the future, or what we have in the past, the singularity in the past. See, I had my theorem, which is, seems to have got me the Nobel Prize eventually, which was a theorem to show that you, in generic collapse, gravitational collapse, you would necessarily get singularities. And Stephen Hawking picked up on these arguments and generalized them and applied them more to the Big Bang curvature and obtain various theorems of this sort. And they had this sort of symmetry. You could apply these theorems both directions in time. But when you look at what the curvatures are like and the actual expectations for what the singularities are like, they're completely different. See, I used to think that quantum gravity was the answer like everybody else. And then I began to worry about this because it would be a very strange kind of quantum gravity, which is completely different in one direction in time from the other direction in time. So I decided, on another way of looking at things, which I'll talk about. This picture is a cartoon of the universe. Time is going up the picture, as I had before. And here we have the Big Bang at the bottom. It expands outwards. The, accelerate, the expansion slows down a bit. And then we have this accelerated expansion in the future, which we started to observe. So we're somewhere up close to the top of this picture, where we're beginning to see this accelerated expansion. At the back of the picture, you may see it's a little bit unclear what's going on. That's deliberate. 
because I don't want to bias the situation as to whether the special geometry is, is closed or open. You see, if it's closed, this picture would close up at the back. If it's open, it would keep on going. I've drawn it so it looks more or less closed just because it's easier to draw the pictures that way. If it's open, it's a bit hard to, to express what I want to here. So I'm not trying to say it really is closed because of the frilly stuff at the back, which means maybe it keeps on going. Okay, but the Big Bang at the bottom is what I want to talk about. Let me move on to the next picture. First of all, have a look at it. According to standard cosmology these days, there's a thing called inflation. And I, if you have to have a very powerful magnifying glass and have a look at what it is. And here is what you would see if you have this part of the top. It's not the universe, that's part of the magnifying glass's handle. But here we have the Big Bang. And we have, a, according to inflation, there is this initial phase of an expansion, an exponential expansion, very similar to what we're seeing in the remote future. Now, I've never believed in inflation. It's put there for various not so good reasons and some good reasons. The good reasons are to have a theory which explains the, the microwave background. This is what first big piece of evidence which told us that the universe really is, has a big bang and there's a very early stage of the universe which was very hot and this radiation is cooled down as the universe expands. And this microwave background is an extremely amazing achievement. But this macro background is almost uniform over the sky, but it has very small variations in temperature. And the curious thing about these variations is that they're independent of the scale. They're the same amount if you look at a small scale or as a big scale. And this was a puzzling thing to try and explain. And this inflationary phase, that's one of the things that it, it would give a, an idea for how to explain it. But the other, one of the other reasons is that the view was that it somehow smooths out the universe. So we might have a very complicated start at this beginning because of its inflationary phase, it would iron everything all out. Well, I want to try and argue that that isn't, doesn't work. The argument is as follows. Let's think of a collapsing universe. This is just my same as my previous picture, but turned upside down. And here we have a collapsing universe. If the first one satisfies the Einstein equations, then this one will because they're reversible in time. However, let's imagine that we put various irregularities in this. As the universe collapses inwards, these irregularities will produce black holes. These black holes will combine and produce one horrendous mess at the end with the curvature, vile curvature violently diverging and producing a horrendous mess. Now that is a much more likely situation than the one we just had, this one. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, you can work out how unlikely it is using the, how unlikely this picture is, by using the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, formula for the entropy in a black hole. And this gives you some enormous figure and the entropy is, uh, gives you a, 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 an impression of how many degrees of freedom there are. And if those get activated, you'll produce this horrendous mess. I won't go into how unlikely it is, but you have a figure like something like improbability of this coming about by chance would be one part in 10 to the 10 to the 124 or something like that, some ridiculous number. Okay, so this is much more likely a picture like that. So the question is, why didn't we get a picture like this for the Big Bang? Much, much more likely. And inflation doesn't get rid of it, you see, because you, if you put your so-called inflaton field, which is what is supposed to give you inflation, let's go back, this inflationary phase, the inflation is governed by what's called the in inflaton field. But it doesn't make any difference to the collapse. You get this picture just the same. It doesn't, doesn't really come at this stage. You have to have something very close to a uniform state before it even works. So what we've got is this, and we have to have a different way of looking at it. So the different way of looking at it, well, let's say something a little bit more about this. Um, it ties in with the second law of thermodynamics in important ways. Here I have an imaginary, well, the top three pictures, we have a, a box and we imagine a gas, which is in a little smaller box in this box and all the gas is packed into that little smaller box. You open the door and it spreads out and it spreads out. So as time moves forward from left to right, that's entropy increasing as well and the uniformity increases. So this is what you would expect for a gas. Now on the bottom, I'm imagining a different situation. This is 
absolutely enormous galactic scale box with a lot of stars in it. And these stars are gravitationally acting upon each other and they start to clump and they clump more and they eventually produce things like black holes. The time is still going from left to right. The entropy is still increasing from left to right, but the pictures look completely different. What we see in the very early universe is uniformity. We see a very, very uniform universe. This is consistent with the entropy being but high in the matter content and entropy being very low in the gravitational content. But what we're seeing is a combination of top right and bottom left. So that's what we have to explain. It's even stronger than this, what this picture indicates because the, in the early universe, this is the, uh, the, uh, the microwave background radiation and we have the different uh, frequencies going from left to right, increasing frequencies and the intensity going up. I should say these error bars are magnified by a factor of 500. So if they were really the sense that say, the normal error bars, they would be reduced by a factor of 500. So they would hug the incline, the center of the incline all the way around. So the, 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 this curve I should explain is the Planck radiation curve, which is what you get for thermal equilibrium. In other words, maximum entropy. When you have matter and radiation together, the Planck curve tells you that's maximum entropy. So what's the, well, the, the microwave background is looking back to, well, um, very early universe, um, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, but very close to the Big Bang compared with what we are now. And when the universe was very hot and concentrated, and as you work your way back and back and back, where well, you see the entropy increases with time. In the so when you go back in time, it's going down. The entropy goes down and down and down and down until you get a maximum. Doesn't make any sense. You might say, well, the universe was a lot smaller those days. That's not the answer. You can go into that. It's certainly not the answer. The answer is just what I was saying before, that what was special about the universe was that the gravity was not activated. Everything else was sort of a maximum entropy, but gravity was not activated. Very, very strange. That's not a feature of quantum gravity. That's something about the universe we see. So that's the universe we see. It's like that in some sense. Now, I want to look at this in a different way. Here I have a light cone. I, I did, well, null cone, I should call it. I had some pictures with null cones in them before, but let me explain them. At each point in space time, I've now got the three spatial axes and the time axis. And the most important thing is the, the null cone. The null cone tells you the speed of light. So to make it look something a lot flattened out along the spatial directions, but something looks reasonable. If you want to use say seconds for your time, you would have to have light seconds, but that's what 300, uh, 186,000 miles or something like that. So that your units are very different in normal time terms because the speed of light is very big, but I'm going to use units. So if it's one second this way, it would be a light second this way. So that you have something which looks pretty like a cone. Okay, now the light cone doesn't give you the whole of the geometry. It gives you 10 out of, sorry, it gives you nine out of the 10 components. The metric has 10 numbers to define it at each point. So you, you to know what the space time is doing, which is its metric. The metric tells you, well, what it really tells you is times. It's really the orig original idea is little distances, but distances are not very good things to measure, especially in relativity theory, because you've got to make sure you've got two things which are stationary with respect to each other and all that. It's much clearer if you talk about times. So here I'm imagining two particles zipping along, not with the speed of light, closer to the they're pretty fast in this picture, but not quite with the speed of light. And we have these hill-shaped surfaces in the past cone and the bowl-shaped surfaces in the future cone. And these indicate the ticks of these clocks. So here we have the blue clock zipping along. Its first tick is where it hits the first surface. The second tick is the next surface. And the crowding of these ticks gives you the metric structure as defined by how clocks run. Now, in fact, Particles are in principle very perfect clocks by these two most famous, famous formulae of 20th century physics. Of course, E equals mc squared is one of them, which tells you that energy and mass are equivalent. 
C being a constant, that's the speed of light. And the second formula is the even earlier one by Max Planck. E equals H nu. Nu is a frequency. H is the Planck constant, so again constant. This tells you the energy and frequency equivalent. Put the two together, that tells you that, that mass and frequency are equivalent. So mass and frequency are equivalent. So if you have a massive particle, it is a clock, a very, very perfect clock. If it's a stable, massive particle, it's a very perfect clock. And this is really why we have such well-defined clocks in nature, because mass is our clocks. We have nuclear clocks and, and atomic clocks and things like that, where it's basically the same thing, but you have to scale it down to something where you can actually measure it. But basically it comes down to the same formula. You have wonderful clocks because the notion of mass is such a wonderfully defined notion. Now, I want to move ahead a little. What about photons? Well, you see a photon zips along the, light, the null cone and it doesn't even see these surfaces at all. So it doesn't even notice the first click of a time, this zero time all the way along the photon. It doesn't even reach its first click of its clock. So photons, if you only have massless things, if you only have massless particles, you're not interested in the, the, the surfaces inside, you're just interested in, in the null cones. So the null cones give you the what massless things measure. It's even more than that because Maxwell's equations, that's the classical equations which uh, govern the, how light behaves. And these equations, that's an absolutely amazing achievement in, uh, in theoretical physics, comparable with Einstein's and Newton's and Galileo and people like that, and quantum mechanics achievements. <clears throat> but the Maxwell equations are conformally invariant. That means that they work just as well if you change your scaling. So you might have different crowdings of these surfaces, but if you just have the light cones, that's all you need for Maxwell's equations. That needs to be filled out a bit, but that's strictly true that if you have these equations for massless particles, well, Maxwell's equations, they are conformally invariant. In fact, you'll find this is more, true much more generally for massless particles and even the gravitational waves. The vial curvature is in fact a measure of the conformal curvature. Now, I use this picture here. It's very convenient for illustrating something about um, infinity. See, here we have a beautiful picture by M.C. Escher. It's one of the circle limits. It's a conformal picture. That means that the, although the, these fish creatures look as though they get smaller towards the edge, the eyes of them, you'll see their circles. They're actually exact circles no matter how close to the edge you get. It's a good measure of this conformal geometry. If you squash vertically and you squash horizontally by the same amount, this gives you a, a conformal squashing. And the fish at this right towards the edge are conformally equivalent to the ones in the middle. And what's nice about this picture is it gives you a representation of infinity in this geometry. It's a geometry called hyperbolic geometry. I won't worry about that. But it does represent the infinity as a nice smooth boundary to the finite region of the space time. And I'm going to use this same trick, but now, well, let me go back to the, the conformal geometry is really the light cones. So if I forget about the crowdings of these surfaces, they can be more or less crowded, but if I just take the, the, the light cones or the null cones, this is the geometry I'm interested in. Now that allows me to do the same trick as the Escher trick, or I should say it's due to Beltrami, that trick, or Poincaré, Beltrami, who's first, um, that you squash down infinity and you get a finite future boundary. It's kind of handy because of the exponential expansion, which I referred to before. This was discovered at the sort of turn of the century. Three people got the Nobel Prize for that. The observations of um, distant supernova stars show that this was this exponential expansion and it's equivalent something you would expect in Einstein's equations if you put in what Einstein put in admittedly for the wrong reason. And he took it out again when he realized it was a mistake because he thought it was a way of uh, having a static universe. Um, and when the, he was convinced that the universe was actually expanding, he regarded it as his most, uh, uh, most blatant, uh, 
I forget the word he was using, but his, his worst mistake. But in fact, his worst mistake was, it was not a bad mistake at all, because it's what explains this exponential expansion. People like to think of other explanations, maybe that this thing is near as mysterious dark energy or something. I don't like dark energy as a term because it's not dark, it's invisible. It's not energy because energy attracts, it doesn't repel, this repels. So it's, it's not really energy in any normal sense of the word. But nevertheless, if, the, if it's the cosmological constant, that's perfectly consistent with what we seem to see. And there are theorems which tell you if you ha only have massless fields in the remote future, Helmut Friedrich has a very wonderful theorem, which tells you that in general, you can squash this down and apply this trick that Escher did in the previous picture to squash it down and have a finite boundary. This will be space-like. It'll be like a moment in time. It's the moment infinity, if you like, but it's all right across something which is a, a, a universal moment in time. Now, what about the Big Bang? You could do the same trick there. You could stretch it out. Um, in fact, I, I used to say I had no idea why the uh, universe was so strange in the past. And I used to postulate a thing I call the vial curvature hypothesis, which was to say that the curvature was the vial curvature for, for some mysterious reason had to be zero in past type singularities and could go and blow up and do crazy things in the future type for some mysterious reason. Now, my student, Paul Todd, he became professor afterwards and he's now retired. I re re realized I've reached an ancient age when all my students are, are retired. But um, anyway, uh, the, he postulated a different way of saying this. Let's say that you could stretch it out conformally and it's smooth so that you could imagine a fictional continuation to the past you see, you can imagine a fictional continuation to the future. And this is the, this fictional continuation of the past is a nice way of saying the condition on the Big Bang for whatever physical reason there might be. Now, it's a perfectly good picture. It's a perfectly good picture, not just from the geometry, but from the point of view of the physics. You see, we have in the remote future a very rarefied, a very cold universe. Now, when you squash it, the Conformal transformation does the opposite thing to the space as it does to the energy momentum. It, the energy, as the, as the space gets squashed down, the energy goes up, the, mo the mass and density goes up, the energy density goes up, and the temperature goes up. When you stretch out, it makes the, the distances larger, the temperature goes down, the density goes down, and they look rather like each other once you've made this transformation. It's quite nice, no, no reason to, I was quite impressed by how similar they seem to be. Now I'm going to do, this is not outrageous, what I've done here. Now I'm going to do something which is regarded as outrageous. Namely, that our Big Bang was the conformal continuation of a previous eon. This is us here, if you like, our, what we think of as our universe. I'm saying it's just one eon, A-E-O-N, of a, an unending continuation of eons where our Big Bang was the conformal continuation of the remote future of the previous eon. Our remote future will be the Big Bang of the next eon. Photons zipping along. You see, I was pointing this where they, they don't experience the passage of time. So they get right out to infinity and they can cross over perhaps into the next eon. Well, this was my model. And it's, in, it's just a hypothesis which says that it would give you the right kind of curvature and something which looked rather like our universe if we imagine that our Big Bang was the continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. Well, I used to go and lecture on this thinking that I can go on forever talking about this because nobody will ever be able to prove me wrong. But then I thought of certain ideas. I'm going the wrong way. See, things can get across. This line in the middle here is meant to be the crossover between one eon and the next. These are the null cones. The null cones continue right smoothly right across. The conformal structure is the null cones, so that they simply go right across from one side to the other in this picture. So also do photons. They could go zipping right across. Well, they could if they could manage to get through all the dense stuff in the next eon. Uh, but still, if they're 
What about gravitational waves? Yes, they could get through too. Maybe there are signals which we could see. Well, I'm going the wrong way. In fact, the first thing I thought about here, you see here is a picture of a crossover between the previous eon and our eon. This is us up here looking back. And this is the stretched out Big Bang, which we see. And this is the previous eon. And there we have some supermassive black holes in some cluster, something running into each other. You see, we are in a, in a cluster of galaxies, which contains us and the Milky Way galaxy, and also the Andromeda galaxy. We are due for a collision, not for quite a long, long time, but not so um, cosmic scales, not so long. And when we crash into the Andromeda galaxy, our respective black holes will feel each other out. They, the Andromeda has got a much bigger one than ours. It will sort of swallow ours out, but there will be a burst of gravitational radiation that will come out. That's with, if we were the previous eon, but this will be happening to people in their previous eon. Their gal galaxies, clusters of galaxies, their black holes will eventually collide in, with each other. And these will be signals, this purple ring signal here. Now, as we look, look back, our intersection will look like a slight change in the temperature. At the bottom, I have a rather faint ring, which is what we would see. This faint ring is faint because the signal is not very strong. It's also smooth. It's, it's well, it, it, it is a slight heating or cooling, depending on whether, which way around things are. If it's far away, it'll be slightly heating. If this thing is closer to us, it'll be slightly cooler, the way things work. Um, so you would see these rings. But if you have several collisions, which I'm imagining here, in a given cluster, they will happen bang, 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 bang several times. And so you will concentric rings which is what you'd see. Well, my Armenian colleague, Vahe Gozajan, looked for these things. And he looked for signals where you look for various, very rings which are, have low variance. That's one feature of these rings, that the variation in temperature will be slightly lower than the normal variation. It's a very small signal, but if you can get a bigger signal, if you look for concentric rings. So he looks for at least three concentric rings. Going the wrong way, here we are. Here's a picture from the Planck satellite data. The Planck satellite um, was analyzed, but when he first looked at the earlier WMAP satellite, but the Planck satellite was um, a, a more refined satellite. And what are these points which we have here? These little points are the centers of at least three concentric low variance rings. What's rather remarkable is that they're clumps. They're not uniform across the sky. I should have pointed that the, the, the two central uh, distorted squares are removed from the signal because that's where our galaxy, galaxy sits. And so he's not looking there at all, but he's looking at centers of rings outside uh, that restrict that removed region. And you can see that they are clumps, very clumps, not only clumped in their re where they are, but they're clumped in temperature. Now, it's a little confusing here, but the red ones are high temperature. And usually one thinks in cosmology is red as red shifted and therefore distant, and blue is blue shifted and not so distant or something. But in this scheme, it's the other way around. So the red ones are blue shifted and therefore therefore distant in this scheme. <laughs> anyway, these, this would be on the theory, a huge super duper cluster of galaxies clumped together, not only in angular distance, uh, they're clumped uh, close together in angular region across the sky, but also in actual distance because the colors are similar. And the blue ones would be within our particle horizon. The blues, the red ones are uh, things we shouldn't even be able to see according to standard cosmology, but you can see outside what's known as our particle horizon because you can see into the previous eon further out than, than uh, our, what's normally considered as our horizon. The blue ones are within our, one should be able to see this, and that maybe there is something that we can see very, very far off, some clumping of, of galaxies over there. This is something more immediate. Anyway, I don't know of any other explanation for the clumping of these signals. It's there in the, in the Planck data. Somebody else would perhaps find another explanation. It can certainly be explained on my scheme. So that's a puzzle. Now, we had this picture before. This is the Hawking evaporation of a supermassive black hole. It takes an awful long time for a big black hole. The biggest ones, 
will take something like 10 to the 100 years, 10 to the 103 years, I think, according to Don Page. And so the biggest black holes that we seem to see, you would have to wait an awful long time before they evaporate away, but they would eventually evaporate away. All the radiation coming out of this, well, I'll show you my next picture. This is taken from a, a paper written by Christoph Meisner, Pavel Nurovsky, Daniel Ann, and myself. And this is the picture in our paper. What it indicates is the horizontal line at the bottom is the crossover between, according to the theory, according to the previous eon, and our eon is above that line here. Well, this is this is a this is a picture of what we see at the top. But here we have a supermassive black hole. The radiation doesn't because everything's so squashed up. Remember the Escher picture from back. I don't know if I can brush it to go back there. I went too far. You see, everything is very, very squashed there. So you imagine that the Hawking evaporation takes place very, very close to that, and all the radiation that comes out will be very squashed up close to that crossover surface, and you would therefore see it. No matter how long it took to cross out, it would be very, very squashed in that little tiny point. So this is what I call a Hawking point. You can't see the Hawking point because between this horizontal line and the next one, this is 380,000 years after the Big Bang. That's when the radiation starts to get out. It scatters itself and produces all sorts of effects. That, that's what um, James Peeble got his Nobel Prize for. Very, uh, he and colleagues, wonderful analysis of exactly what you see here, which agree very well with, with uh, um, the microwave background. But there's an additional feature, according to this, is wherever you have a, a supermassive black hole, just where our past, you see, here's us looking back. When our past cone, light cone, gets just to within this region, so it has to be very specially angled to get just within this region here, 380,000 years spread out. How big is that region? Well, it's about eight times the diameter of the moon. This is about four degrees across. The moon is about half a degree across, so eight times the diameter of the full moon, you have a temperature, it's a very hot spot here, it spreads out, the light scatters and scatters and scatters, and finally comes out at what's called the decoupling surface or the last scattering surface, they're more just the same place, and that's what you see. And, and they would scatter, so you're something like a Gaussian distribution, which is what you see here, warmer in the middle and cooler as you get out to the edge. And we see these signals, you might ask why haven't other people seen them? I think the only reason is they've just not looked because they are there. The strengthening as you go from the outside of this, it's eight times the diameter of the moon to the middle, the biggest, strongest ones, it's about 15 times the normal variations in temperature. And we see, well, the <coughs> confidence level that they're there in the sky is 99.98 according to Christoph Meisner's analysis. And nobody has refuted that as far as I know. It's a very good way of doing the analysis. But the signals are there by that analysis. You can look, you have to use another algorithm to try and find them. And Daniel has used this. It's not so confident at the level that the actual points that he's discovered are Hawking points or Hawking spots. But I think you know, there's a good indication that the five strongest ones in the Planck data, because if you look back in the WMAP data and look at the same places, you find it there exactly in the same spots in, in the older WMAP, completely different satellite, all sorts of different things are looking at the sky in different ways, but you can analyze in the same way and you find that the five strongest points on the, in the Planck data are also there in the WMAP data. You look in the WMAC data and you find another point, which is just about as strong in that, and you look back in the Planck data and you see that's there too. So I think those six points are pretty good candidates for being actual Hawking points. If they're not that, we need another explanation. They're not part of standard theory. Inflation, if it were there, should have wiped them out long ago. So it's not very good. I should have explained that inflation also, the, the, the signals that you get this scale invariance can be explained on the screen because the, I won't go into that because that's probably taking me too far afield. 
I don't know if I've, have I got any more time or should I stop at this point? Um, this would be sort of our normal stopping point, but we got a late start. So if there's, you wanted to say a little. Well, let me just say the other side of the coin. <laughs> you see, I talked about how, I won't say much about this. It's an important topic, but I don't have much time. So let me just say it briefly. I was talking about the singularities, which is the problem here. What about poor old Schrodinger's cat? What about the measurement problem? Well, I'll say a little bit about that rather rapidly. So the main point I want to make is that there is a conflict between the basic principles of general relativity, which here I have is the principle of equivalence. Here we imagine Galileo or some of his friends, maybe, or maybe, maybe just a theoretician, Galileo, theorized that if you dropped a big rock and a little rock from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, they would drop together. If it weren't for the atmosphere, they would drop very cleanly together. And if you had a little insect sitting on one of them, it would look as though you, there was no gravity. It cancels out gravity. Here we have now a futuristic space station and a space traveler, and uh, again, doesn't feel any gravity, feeling falling, falling freely. So that's the principle of equivalence. The principle of superposition in quantum mechanics is that uh, if you have a state, I don't know whether I've got a slide on that. No, I didn't, didn't put that in. So let me go back to that. Here we have, sorry, it's jumped. I, I, I do a theoretical consideration of a tabletop experiment in quantum mechanics. And I want to take the Earth's gravitational fields into consideration. And the normal way that a normal physicist would do would be the green coordinates. You use coordinates which are fixed with the table and you put a term in the Hamiltonian due to the field, to take into account the Earth's gravitational field. That's a standard procedure and you just plug away. Einstein's way on the other hand would be assume, no, there's no gravitational field. The freely falling picture, you'd use your coordinates as though you're fully fr falling freely and then there is no gravitational field. So you don't put a term in the Hamilton, you just use different coordinates. And the green ones, you now use the purple coordinates. And this is the relation between them. And then you work out the wave functions in the green coordinates and the purple ones, and they look almost the same except for this phase factor. Now a phase factor, if you know about quantum mechanics and you want to make measurements, you say, well, it doesn't make any difference. Well, you look a little bit more carefully and then you see there's a little T cubed up there. We said, whoops, it does make a bit of difference. It means you're working in different vacua. But then you can say, well, who cares? It doesn't make any difference. Stick to your vacuum and you're all right. However, now I'm going to change the problem a bit by imagining I had not just a lump of material sitting on the table, but a lump of material, which is part of the experiment. So you put it into a superposition of being two places at once, which you can do in quantum mechanics. In principle, you could, if it was a, certainly an atom or a molecule or something, you can do many experiments where there were two places at the same time. What about a sizable lump of material? Okay, we'll do that. Then you're in trouble because you find that the vacuum changes as you move around and you're stuck because you can't, you can't do that. Your vacuum has to be consistent. So what I do is I say, well, I know I'm a bit stuck, but let me say that's just an error in my calculation. I work out the total error integrating this error over the whole space. And I get a criterion, which is similar, very same to the one which Dioshi, Lajos Dioshi had done previously for different reasons. So his the, he did this in these dates up at the top, somewhat later, I did it by this procedure, which I mentioned to you. I used a different procedure first, actually. That was not my original one, but it comes with, uh, with the same criterion. That is, you have this quantity EG, this EG is a measure of the uncertainty. That's the way I do it. You've got a gravitational, you've got an uncertainty in the energy of the system, which is this how to get wet around the little problem I was mentioning in the previous slide here, that there's uncertainty in the energy of the system. And then I use the Heisenberg time energy, time energy uncertainty relation, which relates an uncertainty in the time to a lifetime of an unstable particle. So I'm saying this is like an unstable particle. It has a lifetime. The superposition has a lifetime. And the measure of that lifetime is given by the uncertainty in the energy. So that's the EG. So I'm saying the lifetime is then H bar H cross over EG. So that's 
it's a sort of like a half-life of the system. So this is the same criterion that Deoshi got earlier, that the system is different from here on. What I'm going to say it's like, I'm now imagining that you have this criterion, and now I have a body which used to be in one place, and then I'm, this time I should say is moving up the picture, it's in one place, and then I move it slightly away from its component, so it's in two places at once, it's over here and it's over here at the same time. And according to this criterion, after a little while, it will become one or the other. Now, it, let's suppose it does that suddenly. If it does it suddenly, then one of these possibilities disappears and the other one becomes the reality of the system. Now, this doesn't make much sense. For the following reason, you can imagine observers moving in different velocities, and these are the, the, the observer A is moving sort of up to the left, and these are the, what's the constant time according to relativity. Is a, this is A naught, first measurement. A2 is the second, no, they're not measurements. A2 is the second um, simultaneous, what's considered simultaneous to A1, to, to observer A. And you see that this particle has become where the lo location of the particle is over here, but it still has a probability of appearing over here because it's still got the dotted line. That doesn't make any sense because that means there's a chance it could be there, perhaps. That means it could be both places at once, which is nonsense. What about observer B? It's the other way around. And then observe to according to B moving up to the right, um, the event Q is still there when, when the thing has become definitely on this location. So there's still a probability that it could be in place. I don't know why it moved. I didn't make it move. Let <laughs> me go back. Ah, oh dear. Yes, here we are. There's a time delay which doesn't, there we go. Okay. However, if we take this back down here, then it's consistent. So what I'm saying is that even though the collapse made it disappear, it's as though it was always on this branch here. It's a strange point of view, but I want to explain it a little more in my next picture. You could have a model where the, the, it doesn't just disappear suddenly, but it sort of fades out. There are arguments against that. I won't go into that here because that would take me too long. But uh, what I'm going to say is it really only makes sense if it takes place here. Now, in fact, it makes sense. Here I have a, an imagined experiment with a laser here firing at the bottom of the picture, firing a high energy photon which encounters a beam splitter or half silver mirror. So the photon goes through and is reflected at the same time. So the photon state is split into this horizontal motion into this vertical downward motion. If it goes out horizontally, then it hits this lump of material and starts to move it a little bit. If it went downwards, it wouldn't move it. So as time progresses, now I'm moving up the picture with time, as time progresses, this lump starts to separate from itself. So it's in these two locations at once. The space-time gets slightly distorted. That's this little bump in the space-time. And the space-time then starts to deviate. So I have two slightly different space-times. Then at a certain point, one of these disappears. Now, what I'm saying is that there are two kinds of reality. The reality, if the classical reality, follows the space-time here. The quantum reality follows the other one and then disappears when the state, it follows the Schrodinger equation, it follows the Schrodinger equation, and then suddenly the state reduces, the wave function collapses, and the quantum reality stops in that point. Now, you see, I'm talking about two kinds of reality. They have a different ontological status. Classical reality is something where it's sort of well-defined, it's there, there in a definite sense. You can sort of get hold of it in a sense. But the way I'm saying it is you can ask of the state, you can say, what is your state? And it can quite legitimately say, my state is X, whatever X happens to be. <clears throat> it could be a, uh, it could be a, where a rock is, my rock is over here. Or it could say where a, where a, a uh, maybe a stone uh, is, or it could say where 
what a gravitational field is, or it could say what an electromagnetic field, as long as we're not looking at quantum mechanics. It's a classical kind of reality. So classical reality, you can ask what its state is, and it can say, yep, my state is X. You can go and measure it, and yes, that's right. Quantum reality is a bit different. You, can, you can't ask it that sort of thing. You can have a good idea what its state might be, and if you have a pretty good idea, you could say, is your state X? And if you're right, it will say with certainty, yes, your st my state is X. If you didn't get it quite right, if you get it completely wrong, well, it might just say, no, your state isn't X. If, if you get it close to being right, it might say, well, some of the time you, might, you do the experiment many times, some of the time it will say, yes, it's X, yes, it's X sometimes not X, but it will disturb the state and change it. So going to the next picture, this is what I'm calling Einstein's dictum. He said that if any way you can predict with certainty by not, with not, by not making a me measurement which doesn't disturb the state, you can predict with certainty, uh, then, the, the, then uh, that gives you a, an element of reality to the state. So Einstein's dictum is what I'm calling the confirming a quantum reality. So this is quantum reality and classical reality. So they're different. They're slightly different. They can be very much the same. In certain circumstances, they're a bit different. And this is a, what I'm illustrating here. That the quantum reality extends up to here. And when the state reduces, it's as though that never really happened. The classical reality was there all the time. There's a reason for doing this because there were experiments. There was a recent experiment done in Italy trying to test, in fact, what they called the Dioshi Penrose model. I was rather embarrassed by that because they disproved it, apparently, because there is a, an effect which, if you, you see, once you have a, if you, if you think of just a quantum reality, then you have the two, a body in two places at once, and then it jumps to being one place. And this could be happening all the time with little parts of a body could be, could be jumping and localizing themselves according to this criterion. And when they localize themselves, it's like a heating. So you get a, you could test this theory by the body getting hotter. And this was a very delicate experiment to see whether this happened, and it doesn't. So it shows that the model which tried to predict it would get hot, hotter is disproved. Well, I'm quite happy with that because you see that's only the quantum reality. The heating would be an effect that you would see in the classical reality and it shouldn't get hotter. You see, I wouldn't like it to get hotter because that means it's losing energy or the he heating of it would, would, would increase its energy, if you like. And this would disagree with general relativity. You would have a, a violation of energy conservation, which would cause problems. And so I don't like the idea of actually heating. And um, the idea you have to, to avoid the heating, you've got this kind of retroactive effect that the classical reality follows this as though the other one branch had never been there. It's a curious thing to get your mind around, but that's what I'm trying to <laughs> encourage people to get their minds around. I don't think there's any contradiction with you know, going back in time and killing your grandfather, all that sort of thing, which people worry about. You can't do it in this scheme, but it's worth thinking about. And is it really consistent? I think it is, but it needs exploring. And there are experiments which you could have, which sort of test it. I don't think I want to go into that, but no, I've said, let's leave it. If anybody wants to ask me about it, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. That was a wonderful talk and an amazing overview, exciting ideas. Um, we're a little bit up on time. So let me ask you, first of all, are you comfortable uh, taking a couple of questions? Oh, sure. We... That's, that's okay. fine. Yes. So then since we are up on time, for those of you who need to head out, thank you for, uh, thank you for coming. And I hope you enjoyed the uh, talk. Um, for those of you who would like to stay, I'm going to do my best at this, but we have a, a lot of people. I, um, I have a uh, participant menu here. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question, uh, please click raise your hand. You can uh, do that under your participant window. And I will try to keep a close eye on this, uh, but please bear with me. It may take a minute. Um, also feel free to put in the chat a question if you would like to do that. Um, so let me, I'm just going to go through, and as I see the hands come up, John Harris, um, do you want to? Uh, yes, 
Thank you, sir, for this uh, very nice lecture. Um, I have a question going back to your uh, slide, which represented the Meissner and Penrose paper of the previous Aeon. And there, I think you said, okay, well, I know you said there's no inflation, uh, but I guess my question was going to be, maybe you get to the slide and then I'll ask. There, oh, you just went past it, or? The Meissner, yes, there. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, so, um, yeah, my question was gonna be what actually happens between the Hawking point, you kind of said something, Oh, yes. And the the CMB decoupling in terms of, you know, you said there's no inflation, but what about, you know, vector on quarks, nuclei, even supersymmetric particles? Has this been developed to kind um, of tell us how that evolves? Um, Christoph has done some analysis on this, which I think is quite important. You see, you have to have a, I mean, I hadn't, of course, any time to talk about this in detail. You have to describe the evolution in this model by some sort of equations. And so what I do is I have a, a metric for the previous eon, a metric for the subsequent eon, and there's a bandage metric, which, is, which covers both. And this, there's a conformal factor relating the previous eon to the bandage metric, conformal factor from the bandage metric to the next eon. And the, in the bandage metric, everything works very nicely and smoothly. So you can cross right over your equations carrying you over from one side to the other. There are certain problems about unique evolution. Um, they work, according to Paul Todd, there's a, they work best if the universe is spatially closed. I'm not trying to plug that particularly. Um, there are probably some things which, more things which need to be done about the equations, but the particular things here don't make much difference to that. Okay, you can evolve across. Now, when you're in the bandage metric, you can more or less work with either metric. You can work with the previous metric and it's consistent. I'm sorry, you can either, you can work with the conformal factor, the bandage conformal factor, um, and you can, actually work with the with the previous metric in the in the in the next eon. Um, what am I trying to say here? I'm not saying it very well. There is a little stretch of time where you can actually cross over and the worst problems about uh, I think the sort of question you're raising. Certainly a question about about some um, Planck scale problems and things like that. You can get over that. And so you're the worst difficulties about the quantum field theory. Um, I'm not an expert in quantum field theory, but he is. And he, he worked, looked at this and he said, you can get over that and, and you can deal with the equations pretty well after that. So uh, this is a long before inflation, I should say. I think you see 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Uh, physics is where you're, where you're worrying about quantum gravity. And you can, you can extend the metric you see, if you go back to the previous metric, you have a collapsing universe. In that collapsing universe, you can still work it. The, the problem is that the collapsing universe has a negative gravitational constant, and it leaves you into trouble after a little while. So then you have, really have to go over to the next. I, I've been going into this too much detail. I should say that they don't cause problems. That would have been what I should have said. For quite a technical reason, which is really rather interesting that Christoph went into. You, you can carry your equations over and uh, you can get over to a point where, where um, okay, there are all sorts of quarks and gluons and who knows what, but they will be all constrained within this area. So you're, you're having, basically all you're doing with the equations is having an input of an enormous amount of energy at that point. That amount of energy is something you can calculate because when you're on outside, you can do an integral around the outside. You see, you can do integrals which carry through the conformal geometry and you can work out how much energy there is in this corking point on the other side. And it's a finite thing. It's big, but it's a finite thing. And so you, can, you could estimate how much is coming through there. And then that spreads out and it scatters like mad as things do. And, uh, I, 
I mean, clearly the detailed physics would be diff difficult there, but you don't have to worry about Planck scale physics. Okay. That, I so, guess, if that was so your you're, yeah, yeah, you're saying the evolution is more or less the same, but the real it, more sticky point is around the Planck scale. And once you have that, then, yes. then you can say things evolved kind of like after inflation in a way somehow. Yes, I think that's okay. right. I have to try energy to wise and part of memory is a little bit hazy about you see inflationary phase. That's what's ten to the minus thirty. Ten to the minus thirty one seconds is where it's supposed to turn off or something like that, isn't it? So you're you're. I've forgotten where he was looking, but there isn't any inflation in this in this picture. So there's no right. impact on field. There's no inflation. The smoothness comes from the the smooth. I mean, the, the, every, everywhere else is a very smooth transition. You have okay. these little points where it's violent. This is a singularity in the evolution, if you like, across, because the, uh, it's more than Planck scale, if you like. But it's like just an injection of a huge amount of energy. OK, thank you. Uh, so maybe uh, to take the question from Nikodem Poplowski. Oh. Thank you, uh, Professor Penrose. Greetings from University of New Haven. I have uh, one question uh, regarding eons and cycles. So uh, every big bang uh, starts with very, very hot uh, temperature and at uh, future infinity universe becomes very, very cold. So in order to uh, uh, one cycle go into another cycle, is there a conformal uh, mapping of temperature. So basically the hot yes. temperature becomes cold temperature. Yes, that's correct, yes. I should have said one thing to justify this. I should, I should have, I forgot to mention it really. You see, in the remote future, where I was thinking about originally, it's Maxwell's equations because it's mostly photons. In the, in the remote past, you have very, very high temperatures and so, pretty well mass becomes irrelevant because everything is moving around so fast as the closer and closer you get to the Big Bang that you're more or less dealing with massless particles. So it's not quite right in the remote future because you have massive things as well. So I need an, a, a hypothesis, which is that there is a fade out of mass as well. But that is the, is, is the main hypothesis in the scheme apart from the, the whole scheme. Um, but your question, uh, was sorry remind me what your question was exactly basically uh, can there be any conformal mapping to the ensure the temperature that hot yeah. becomes basically cold yes indeed yes that's all part of the picture yes that's right as i was saying where, where it's very hot and you do the conformal stretching that makes it colder and so it has to be consistent with the cooling down as you approach the big bang and the speeding and the oh, oh. yes yeah. and if those yeah. and because temperature can also be related relatively to Planck temperature which is combination of fundamental constants would yes. that mean that maybe fundamental constants are different in each eon <laughs> well that's a good question thank you um it's a good question i'm trying to say no but that's just a bias but there is one small piece of evidence that is that the in this picture, you see, I was talking about the, uh, well, let's go back, go forward two pictures, I think. Here with you, we have these supermassive black holes encountering each other. Now, when does that start happening? You see, it starts happening sort of now. When I say now, I mean, black holes are beginning to starting to run into each other. We, how far up are we in this picture? We're about well, this is our eon, so I should say we're about here. Three quarters of the way up. It's roughly speaking three quarters of the way up. Now, that means that the black holes, when they start to collide, would be if there's no change in the constants. If there's a change, it could be anything. But let's suppose that the previous eon was roughly speaking like ours. So the black holes are roughly speaking as big as ours, and they start to collide when around about when, when ours would. So th roughly three quarters of the way down. So that means how big do the rings get that, that Bahe sees in her picture? Well, it's about 40 degrees across the sky. So there is a sort of limit to how big these rings should be. Well, he sees them up to about 30 degrees. 
So that's not bad. But, I mean, you probably wouldn't see all of them. You might see the, uh, well, I wouldn't expect to see the absolute biggest ones, but you could see them 30 degrees across the sky. That's pretty, pretty, uh, I don't know, right about here, you see in the previous eon. So they should be starting to run into each other round right about then. So it's not far off. All I'm saying is that one piece of evidence is to show it's not radically different from ours. Now, of course, the constants of nature might evolve, and that's rather a disturbing feature. I'd rather they didn't because I have enough problems on my hands. <laughs> but uh, who knows? Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. much. I think, in the interest of time, if this is a, a reasonable time for us to thank Roger for, for your presentation, for your efforts in putting this together. To everyone in the audience uh, for your participation. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience with the technical challenges at the beginning. This is part of doing business. Um, so uh, our gratitude to you, uh, Roger. We look forward to hearing more and thank you to everyone. We'll see you at next year's uh, Miller Bright Lecture in 2022. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. Huh? So, Eduardo or uh, Walter, if either of you are able to close the Zoom session. This yeah, I, I'm. I'm waiting because uh, I, uh, I, I hope. I hope the recording is on the cloud. But if not, it's going to. So, do you want me to hit stop recording? Okay. If, I'm still, if I'm still here talking to people. Uh, no, no, we all. Uh, um, no, no, I was only got this. It wasn't meant to be a public talk question. It was, is Miller the same person? There are, there's a Miller Fellowships. I had a student who was on one of these. Is that the same Miller? I don't think so, because I, I did a fair bit of digging around about him, about John Milton Miller, and did not find anything about a fellowship in his name. I think it was either a scholarship or fellowship. There wasn't okay. anything like that. Okay, yeah, well, no, I didn't, I didn't well, that's quite a common name, so it needn't be. I was just wondering yeah. about it. And a number of things that were named for him were very specifically named the John Milton Miller something. Oh, I, I don't know, yeah, okay. Um, well, I'm sorry, but I, I think I should have learned to, I have to, I learn new lessons each time. I should have moved something away, shouldn't I? That was what it did, I didn't do. Yes, that's, I, okay. I can yeah. move. I can move it. I got that thing in the way, and I couldn't see what was happening. This is my first time hosting a a, a colloquium like this on <laughs> Zoom, so I think we're all all coming yeah, up to speed one minute at a time. Well, I, I've got a lecture. I've got a lecture in Chile on Friday, <laughs> and they were very helpful to me. I learned several things from them, but I didn't realize this was what was happening here. Yeah, I think I think I should I should have moved that out of the way. That's it. So uh, Professor Penrose, this is uh, uh, Oliver Baker. I wanted to thank you again for accepting our invitation. 